welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am Kristen Ostrander. And I am Amy Fairman. And happy holidays. This is the last live episode of the Amazon Files in 2018. And we had to, you know, come in in style. I got the rockin' elf ears going on here in my jingles. Well, they're Magic. like bulbs. And as promised, in the Facebook group, our friend Paul posted in the Facebook group that he found the sweater that says, the struggle is real, this ugly Christmas sweater. And I was like, hey, if this thing gets over 100 likes, then I'll totally go find the sweater and buy it. So guess what? After three at Walmart and another one later, my mom found the struggle is real, ugly Christmas sweater. I can barely show it to you. I can show you like a little bit. It's got Santa. Yeah, he's stuck in the chimney. Yeah. So funny story about the sweater. I do have it. It has jingle balls and everything. See? <laughs> um, but the funny story about this is that Paul failed to mention when he challenged the um, ugly sweater that says the struggle is real on it was that it's a youth size. So we had to hunt everywhere for one that would actually fit. So now we have it. So in case you're wondering, the struggle is certainly real with the sweater, but I am excited to wear that because where else can you get something that has your cool catchphrase on it and have it be so amazingly festive? <laughs> Yeah, so guys, we are in the holiday spirit. I don't know if you read the email from today, but I hope you're joining us with some hot cocoa or some eggnog, because I could use me some eggnog right about oh, now. Eggnog. We love need it. Here. Eggnog, who, who likes eggnog? Honestly, can you guys like say me if you like eggnog or if you don't, like, oh, yuck, I'm with Linda, yuck. Can't handle it. I absolutely love it in about this much, and I mix this much with milk. <laughs> So it's not truly eggnog, and I do not put any alcohol in it because that, no, not going there. But yes, the festives are on. I hope you are here to enjoy this. But guys, this is not just about festive holiday fun. We are getting down to business tonight because we do know Q4 is coming to a close, and it is time to start thinking about 2019, which, guys, is just around the corner. I know it seems like it's far away because Christmas isn't here yet, but as soon as Christmas hits, it's going to be like, whoop, all of a sudden it's 2019. Where did that come from? And we want you to be prepared. And being prepared, part of that is understanding what you want to do in 2019. And the best way to help you get there is help you lay out some goals for what you want to accomplish. Yeah, we are super excited about telling you about some of these things. FBA goals in particular, um, because yeah, everyone can have goals and all that. But a lot of people struggle with, um, <laughs> the struggle is real. A lot of people struggle with the setting realistic goals for their Amazon businesses. And we're going to talk a lot about those because I've heard some of my favorite ones and I'm like, Oh, when I do like the head slap thing of like when someone says, I'm going to do this or that. And you don't want to be like a dream crusher, but you want to be like, um, okay. So even at this level, like I don't even attempt that because I don't want to crawl under my table and cry. So we're going to get to some of that. But first we have a special holiday gift for you. Um, because, and due to popular demand, we've had some sad people come to us and say, we really, really wanted that Q1 class and the um, offer expired. So after much contemplation, we decided to bring it back to the table for a short period of time as our gift to you. So if you still want the Q1 class that we have, remember this Q1 class is the one that basically tells you everything to sell in Q1, all the different ideas, all the different holidays, all the different events to basically set you up for watch this for an hour and a half, get some really good ideas and basically go clear the shelves. You still have time. We're sending in like new year's resolution stuff like right now. So it hits the shelves. Everyone's ready the day after Christmas to be like, Ooh, I need to lose a few pounds after all them Christmas cookies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right here. I know. I, I'm, a, I'm a cookie monster. I love, I probably have cookie cookies monster. <laughs> that I have not loved. So um, I welcome all the cookies and then the gym welcomes me after Christmas. <laughs> um, with that being said, everything that you want to sell for Q1, the class is reopened so that you can go enjoy that if you missed out on last time. So mommyincome.com slash Q1 will let you in the Q1 doors. We just felt like some people really missed that for whatever reason. They couldn't get to their email and they didn't make it in time. So we reopened it a little bit for you guys. So jump in now before you miss it again. Yeah, if the link were working. So I will make sure the link is working again because I'm pretty sure that instead of putting that it expires on January 1st, 2019, that I may have put that it expired on January 1st, 2018. So okay. hold on a minute. I will make sure we go live okay, with that. Well while she's talking about that, I'll go into talking about the workshop. She will fix the link because she's like a technical genius. And so um, she only messes stuff up like this when she's super busy, which she is like 
really busy right now because she does amazing things. You guys, I can't wait to show you guys what we're doing, but we can't because it's like 2019 stuff and workshop stuff. Um, the workshop is going to be amazing. We are so excited about this workshop. Atlanta's all filled up, so you can't meet us in Atlanta anymore. We actually had some people that were sick and could just could not make it for whatever reason, and those seats resold and sold out, and so now we only have a few spots left for Lansing in March, and then some seats in Columbus, Ohio in August, and so there's some seats left for those. You guys want to join us for this thing. It's going to be so much fun, amazing. We do have a VIP like mixer party for those of you guys who invest in the VIP package. We just can't wait to meet you. We're getting more and more excited today. We had a little meeting about it, and we're like, oh, we're just we can't wait to meet all of you guys that are coming, and we're excited. So make sure that um, if you are thinking about a workshop seat, that you sign up as soon as possible because they will um, sell out the, the closer that it gets. All right, the link is back up and functioning. You may have to redo your cash to actually get to the link. The struggle is real, right? This is what happens when you try and think in advance and do things to make it easy. Well, 2018 is coming to an end. 2018 is coming to an open. So I hope that you have booked your seat to one of the workshops because I'm super excited about everything that we've been working on for them. Um, I've been doing a lot of finalized touches on the curriculum that we're going to be teaching and a lot of other goodies along the way. Um, and if you guys can't make the workshop, there's plenty of other stuff coming in 2019. So we're not going to leave you hanging. So we are super, super excited about wh what's happening. Um, but let's get into talking about goals. We're, we got goals coming out our ears right now when it comes to mommy income stuff. So let's start talking about FBA and goals for 2019. So, you know, most people, just to start out the gate, we're talking about goals and setting goals and things like that. Like most people overcomplicate them. Okay. So I know I'm sure, you know, everyone's going to be talking about goals this time of year and things like that. And so first of all, don't get analysis paralysis and listen to 500 different people and how to set goals and all that. Like zero in and focus in on something that's not overcomplicated. Most of the time people put higher expectations on themselves than is actually possible. And then they set themselves up for failure. And the, the hardest part about that is that people want all these things because they want to get to the end faster. And honestly, people set these big, huge, crazy goals, which we're not, we're not opposed to that. So we will get to that a little bit later, but setting some big, huge, the in a perfect world, right? That's what we talk about. And so in a perfect world is so much different than setting some big, huge, crazy goal that you're not going to reach, at least not this year. Um, but sometimes the biggest issue that people have is being in a hurry. They want that thing that's out there and they want it so badly, whether it's to quit their job or to you know, pay off all their debt or whatever it is the reason they're doing this, they're in a big, huge hurry. Oh, and being in a big, huge hurry is not a great way to get anywhere successfully. All right, even when you're driving somewhere, these people that weave in and out of the lanes are not going to get you anywhere faster. They're actually going to get dead faster is what's going to happen to them. So we want you to be able to think through things and not, not push towards somebody else's finish line. I know especially this time of year, there's a lot of people posting big numbers in Facebook groups. And you want to be where they are. I've been in that, those shoes. I want to be where somebody else is. But we want you to be where you get to in the time frame that makes sense for you. You have your business. You have your amount of capital, your amount of time to invest. You don't know all the things about the back end of this person's business. You don't know how much they invested. You don't know how much time they have. And so only comparing yourself to you is a better place to be so you're not rushing towards somebody else's finish line. And if, you know what? It if you work for yourself, why are you in a hurry? It's not like this boss man is standing over your shoulder telling you, you have to get this done by this date or you're fired. I mean, that's actually true. Now we are a firm believer in goals. We're a firm believer in deadlines. We want them to be reasonable. And we'll talk about what that means as far as FBA and bundles and wholesale and what's reasonable. But the first thing you have to write down, remember, stamp into your mind is that you cannot do your best work when you're in a hurry. We teach this to our children. We teach this all the time. So like how many times you rush out the door and you forget something? How many times you rush doing something or you know, <laughs> I'm throwing myself right under the bus this week, but rushing off to church 
this week and forgetting something is the main reason. So we, our church has this like huge 14 foot tree every year and they adopt like 20 families from the community. And so we can do Christmas gifts and stuff and they hang these tags like all over the place and it's amazing. So we pick out tags and we, you know, buy gifts for these you know, kids and families or whatever, and we bring them to church by a certain date. And of course, the deadline was Sunday. And of course, I didn't bring them early. I bring them on the deadline. And we are in a rush for church, realizing we're going to be a few minutes late, which I cannot stand. And um, we are halfway down the driveway. And I'm like, wait, we forgot the gifts and they're due today. And so we had to back up and go back. Why? Because we were in a hurry. Why? Because Allie needed to make sure she had a bath and had her shower because she was going to see Santa that day and have all her get up. And, you know, we were in a rush. And so what happens? We didn't do our best because we were in a rush. And so um, we were late because, you know, all those things. That's the same kind of thing I'm talking about here. So if you're in a rush to just like buy the next thing and do the next thing, create the lesson listing and throw another bundle together and all this stuff, it's not going to be your best work. And if, if it's not going to be your best work, it's not going to be your best payout. Oh, the struggle is certainly real, guys. Listen to Kristen on her soapbox for a minute and soak that in. Especially this time of year, we're always in a rush. We're always in a hurry. And we don't want to take that rush, rush and hustle bustle into the new year. The new year is a time to slow down and make sure you pay attention to the podcast episodes coming up because there's going to be some good ones about slowing down and reflecting and looking into the new year too. Um, but slowing down and being able to really spend some time looking forward so you're not just always in a hurry. Don't take this rush of the holiday season into the new year. Spend some time to say, this is putting some action steps in place so you're actually taking the steps you want to in Q1, not getting halfway into February and then realizing where, where the last six weeks go, what just happened? Well, and the thing is, is that like, I, I don't project very much into the future. I think a little bit down the road enough to get by, but um, I don't know, keep mentioning all this stuff like that. Like, you know, I guess you can press exit if you're not spiritual or don't believe in God or whatever, but i um, actually doing some writing right now and um, the Bible verse that my word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And what that actually means um, back in the day was people used to put lights, lamps, or candles like near their, their feet because they couldn't see at night. There were no street lights. There were no, unless it was a full moon, it was extremely dark to walk at night. And so people would, any lanterns, anything like that, they would literally tie them to their shoes. And, um, and then that would light the very next step in front of them. And I absolutely love that because that's literally like, how I kind of make decisions. I try not to look too far ahead because I don't know what's going to happen in five years. If you'd asked me five years ago if I was going to be where I am right now, I'd have laughed at you. Five years ago, they were closed on my house. I didn't know Amy. We didn't have a show. We had nothing. And so um, I don't like to look that far ahead because things are always changing. So you want to have goals and dreams, but make sure they're fluid. Make sure that you leave room to let God do what he's going to do in your life because you just never know. And you just got to be, it's like a constant surprise. You never know what's going to be around that next corner. But as life changes, so do our ideas about the future. So planning for 2019 is great. Let's don't even talk to me about 2020. Well, in 2020 and 25 and 27, uh, no, we're not going there. How about just let's look at the next year and see that. So in order to start doing that, you have Hold to, on. I'm going to slow you down for a minute. Okay. okay. There are two. I even have to slow down. See? Slow. <laughs> there are two sides to that coin. There are those of us who can project further into the future and there are people who are better taking that first step. Now, it's good to have both and you have to figure out which one works for you. You still have to, even if you're a goal planner who plans out five years down the road, which I don't go that far. But if you're still looking in the future, you still need to be able to figure out what your next step is. So whether or not you're thinking further down the road or you're thinking in 2019 or in the next 30 days, you still have to figure out what that next one step is. And that's what we want to help you do is be able to have that goal and work your way back so you know what you're working towards, but you also know, hey, I know exactly what I need to do today to, or tomorrow or next week to actually make that accomplished. Accomplishable is not a word. <laughs> be able to accomplish that. Yes, I'm making up words today. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, having that big thing that's like that idea and making sure that that's kind of fluid. Like well, that's that's the in a perfect world that we're always talking about. That in a perfect world is five years from now. I'd love to see this, and then bringing it back down into this one step of saying, okay, if that's the top of the staircase, what is the very next step? that I can take the light onto my path, very next lighted path. Not thinking about, well, halfway up, I've got to do this and this. No, no, no. So having that big 
end of the staircase up here, or the top of that staircase, and then literally just focusing on the next step. So yes, we need to have both and. And so how do we do that? We have to have focus and we have to have aim. We have to have something that we're pulling back the bow and shooting at, you know, so that we know if we're missing way over here or we're getting closer, where are we aiming? So that's narrowing our focus on some FBA type goals. Like what do you want to work towards? What kind of goals are there out there to set? We're looking at sales goals. I know when a lot of people think goals, they think number related goals, sales goals, profit goals, number of products, number of vendors. But there's also other things out there, finishing a project, creating new listings, even creating your first new listing. That's a huge goal. That's a huge accomplishment when you're able to get that done. Getting better at research. There are a lot of things out there. Now, when you create these, being able to put a smart, goal, something that you can attain, that you can find and measure is helpful. But all of these things allow you to get better. Yeah. And creating, you know, some of these things that don't necessarily have to be numbers goals. These things don't have to be like, well, I want this by a certain date. So setting some deadlines is great, but you want to make sure that they're reasonable and realistic. So when people are realistic, they, you have to, you have to think about these things. So this is the one that always makes me cringe all the time. Um, the things that make me cringe are when people say, oh, I'm going to create three new bundles every single week. All right, I have to throw myself under the bus for that one because I had to laugh. This past week, I went and sat down for four hours at Wegmans and I read through my 2015, 2016 journals. And one of my goals in 2016, obviously I never shared this one with Kristen, was to create eight new bundles a week. <laughs> if Kristen had ever known that I had written that goal down, she would have come out through the computer and smacked me upside the head. Well, this is a lesson in sharing your goals with your accountability partner, um, because then you can set someone straight and you can say, look, I don't know how reasonable that is. That's a great idea. However, how well, and this is what we're going through, you guys, we do this to each other all the time. I'll say something about, about something and Amy's like, well, that's a good idea, but have you thought of this, 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 and this, and these are all the steps that you're going to need to do within that. I'm like, yeah, okay, we're going to need to add another four weeks to that, you know, whatever. Um, and that's the thing you have to think about. We're talking about doing your absolute best. Can you do your absolute best by creating eight new bundles in a week? That's more than one a day. It takes me, honestly, I'm just being honest with you guys. Sometimes it takes me a full week to create a really good bundle at all the research, looking at vendors, missing, missing, mixing and matching different things from different vendors, deciding what goes together. I literally sometimes cut up my catalogs and arrange the pictures on like a puzzle on the page to see, does this look right? Is that going to be okay? You know, not after all the research that I already do and just looking at keywords, looking at them again, sometimes it takes me a good week, but let me tell you something. This entire 2018, I've actually only had three bundles that have not been home runs, that have not been, wow, this sold out and I had to replenish them, or were really good for seasonal and so on. Three bundles. One of them I pulled back, repurposed, and set the things in separately, and it's doing fine now. The other one actually just sold the first one yesterday. I No joke. I finally went in and was like, I have to tweak this thing again. If it doesn't sell by the end of the year, it's out of here. And I started that one, I think, in August, and it just hadn't sold a single one until literally yesterday. Um, so obviously, it's kind of a seasonal thing. Um, and I'm realizing that now, but still I needed to buy it in August. And so it's okay. So that's why if I spend a week on a bundle, I know it's going to be good because I put the time and energy and effort into it and didn't just plow through to try to get the next bundle. So really slow down. It's slowing down. The more intentional you are about what you're doing, whether you're creating a listing, creating a bundle, or you are finding new vendors in a new niche, or whatever part of the Amazon journey that you're on, or it's researching a product line that you're going to do retail arbitrage for, spending the time, energy, and effort is going to pay off in the long run. Kristen creates bundles that sell consistently daily because she spends the time, energy, and effort to get there. If you're trying to just plow through and create as it's quantity over quality, guys. Okay. If you're trying to create a bazillion of them, or whatever that. it is, quality, say it the other way around. Quality <laughs> over quantity. Let's clarify that. We're not doing quantity here. So I don't hear like my jingle bells. 
<laughs> jingle bells around my sweater. I apologize in advance. No, seriously though, the quality is everything. And wouldn't you rather have a, a really good selling replan that sells consistently that you spend a week or two on rather than one that you're like, oh, I just kind of threw this together and throwing it spaghetti at the wall and hoping it sticks. That is not how we do bundles, people. And so not how we should do bundles. And do we get stuck in ruts? Do we, when we, when you find that you are not getting the quality of things that you should be, look at the time you're spending, slow yourself down. Slowing yourself down can be painful for those of us who are like, go, 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 go people understood, but it pays off to slow down. This is not whoever gets to the finish first wins. In the Amazon game, it's whoever stays in business the longest wins. Money. Yeah. Money is good. People so, stay in business the longest and make a profit year over year over year, hopefully an increasing profit or a steady profit. We don't have to have really high profit here and all of a sudden you're tanking down to here because you were run, 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 run. Like this, we've seen people go out of business this way. And we have an episode coming up on our podcast only. We do have two more episodes for the podcast coming up this year on the we're not doing a live show on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. Sorry to disappoint. Um, but we do have podcast episodes. And one of them is really, it was super exciting for both of us to talk about the failures of some of these big box stores. So stay tuned because we have one like that. We can learn from other people's failures. And that's one of the things. So when we set these goals that are too high, we ending up, we end up rushing to meet them. And then we end up in a bigger mess because we didn't meet the goals and then we're beating ourselves up and then we're talking failure. And then we think that we're going to close our store and we're not doing good enough and blah, blah, blah. When honestly, it's just a matter of, I kind of, you know, be real with yourself. Look it down and be like, you know what? The reason I didn't do well is because I set my sights too high. I didn't meet that. I rushed through it all. And now I've got a huge mess. If this is classic tortoise in the hair. Okay. And so for, I mean, I'm guessing everyone on the planet knows this story, but just in case there's one person that has never heard this, the classic tortoise in the hare, where the, the hare gets off to a great running start, running, sprinting towards the finish line, wants to get there quickly. I'm the fastest, I'm the best. The tortoise just takes very small, consistent steps. And then the hare gets really burned out really quickly, has to take long breaks, catches breath, take naps, reset, try a little slower, and then gets more tired. Tortoise keeps small, little steps consistently, even if it's slow, consistently taking that step. As the hair continues, repeats this constant sprint, stop, repeat, go back, fix messes, come back. The tortoise reaches the finish line because he was consistent. That's really the game. It's not this push, pull, up, down. It's just slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady. So think of it in your own business. What is one thing that you have been sprinting, pushing every ounce of effort into, but not really spending the time on. You can be busy and feel like you're doing all of the work in actual, in actuality, not really accomplishing anything in that same amount of time. So you're doing poor execution instead of spending the time to sit back and take those steps slower. So each one of the steps along the way gets the full energy and attention that it truly deserves. You know, does it really matter if you reach a goal, but you did a really crappy job? I mean, is that what you would teach your kids? Just hurry up and get it done and get it through it. You know, we'll fix the messes later. No, that's not what we do. We teach our kids to do their best. Even if that's C plus work and they've done their absolute best, then we're proud of them. And we pat them on the back and we say, you did your absolute best. If they get you know, if they get all D's and they rush through it, you're not going to be proud of them. You're going to be like, what happened? Or, you know, I just, I didn't do my best, but you know, I got done. So who cares? You know, that's not how we're going about this. This is your business. This is just something that you have to start paying attention. The, the, the importance is not the timeline, although we definitely need to have a deadline and keep some good boundaries of, I'd like to get this done by this amount of time. And I'm going to give myself a reasonable amount of time to do that. You know, looking at numbers, remember, we don't base goals on big, ambiguous hopes. We base goals on previous experience, numbers, and data. It's not about, well, I hope to get there. Like the last three years in a row, we've doubled year over year. So it seems like if we do the same amount of work, and we want to increase 20%, then we're going to have to increase 20% of our time, money, and effort to get that much more. 
We might have to hire help. We might have to do this. So we'll get to that in a little bit because I know that's at the bottom. But seriously, you have to think about those things. You can't cut corners. You can't make excuses. You have to do your absolute best. No, what you can do is do that one step that I mentioned earlier. So you're setting one step goals. You have your in a perfect world scenario, but it's those one step goals that are gonna be the stepping stones that help you get there. So what are those one step goals? Know that, write the in a perfect scenario. If you do not have your in a perfect world scenario, spend some time and put it down on paper. Cause guys, if that's another thing while I will say about goals, if your goals are not written down somewhere, it's really hard to achieve them because I guarantee you, you can set all the goals in the world that you want to set. But as soon as you put them out and, and if they're not out on paper, guess where they go? They go into the back of your brain somewhere and you kind of forget about them. We don't want you to forget about them. The whole point of spending the time, energy, and effort to put goals out there is so you can actually accomplish them, right? Yeah, you can accomplish them and you can learn what it takes to do that. And so let's talk about bundle goals because a lot of people, you know, we're the bundle queens and we want to make sure that a lot of people listening are, are either starting bundles in this coming new year or they're working on bundles now. And, you know, they have these big, huge, lofty things. I'm going to create, you know, what'd you say, eight? <laughs> cringing inside. Um, I'm going to create three new bundles every single week, you know, blah, 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 all year long. Um, let's be real. It's not happening. Your goal oh. should be built to be the, your goal should be to build the best bundle using all the tools at your disposal. Make sure that you put the time in for research. <sighs> research. Number one key to successful bundles. Did you listen to Kristen earlier in the show? and how much time she puts into creating the best bundle that she can. Guys, it's not done in a 15 minute hustle. Now you can build bundles 15 minute hustles at a time, but it's 15 minute hustles strung together. You cannot create amazing, awesome bundle that's going to sell 150 a day in 15 minutes. <laughs> I that would be amazing. I use the 15 minute hustle strategy sometimes when I'm doing catalogs, because otherwise I'll get sucked into 15 hours. And no, then I no, 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 no hustle. <laughs> Kristen likes her catalogs with a glass of wine, maybe a bottle, and all of her sticky notes and her colored sharpies oh, and a comfy couch. Real. <laughs> I would be on the floor if I drank a whole <laughs> bottle. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Anyway, um, seriously though, that like that, thats what I'm saying. It can be done in 15 minute hustle. And just a little tiny secret for you: uh, we are working on an amazing framework for research that we are going to share with you in the not so distant future. Um, we finally put some more pieces together. We are just polishing this baby up so that when we're done, you can do it in 15 minute hustles because it's going to be broken down in even smaller steps. We're so excited about it. That's all I can say. Otherwise, Amy will literally send me a message to say, shut up now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen likes to throw herself under the bus. Kristen would share all of the things all of the time. I know. I'm, I get there. We want to make sure that it is the best possible that it can be. Now, part of the, the big word in everything that we are trying to, to really get across to you is realistic goals. Realistic. Because you can set and try and say, I'm going to accomplish eight bundles. Okay, that's great. But what's the reality of you actually accomplishing that goals? I'm going to run a marathon in three months. What's the reality of that actually happening and me not dying? <laughs> it's not realistic at all, guys. I haven't run a mile since high school. Well, and that's the thing. Is it if you're already a marathon runner? So we'll we'll kind of use this scenario. If you've already ran several marathons, you know what the training is. Your body's already been in shape because you've never stopped running. Then that might be realistic for you. So if you've been doing bundles for a couple of years and you really got the hang of it and you really know your process and what you do every time, then that then you're allowed to do more. Um, and so you know what I mean. Like picking one. If you're brand new, you're gonna give yourself more time. Now. <clears throat> Analysis paralysis is not allowed. So give yourself a week to create a really good bundle, but give it a week. After the seven days, you're going to pull the trigger on the bundle. I'm not going to let it sit and be like, oh, I should give it another week. I should really make sure. Like, the numbers speak for themselves. The data will speak for itself if you dig all the dirt. Guys, this is not about getting a tattoo that's going to be permanently on you for the rest of your life that you should think about. Most people don't even think about that. This is about something that, yes, you're investing money in, Ask yourself the question, what's the worst that could happen? Take the plunge and get that bundle in. If you just sit on it, you just wasted all of that time and it's clogging up 
the creative juices in your brain to be able to take the next step and do the next thing, whether that's creating another bundle or doing something else in your Amazon business. Take it, put it out in the world, and then come back around and evaluate it later. Okay, so Julia's asking a really great question and I'm gonna ad address it right now. So it doesn't have to take a week, but sometimes, first of all, I'm not spending eight hours a day, seven days a week creating a bundle. I have way more things on my table than that. But like, for example, um, you know, from the start to the finish of going through and finding a bundle. So all of the components that are involved in building a really good bundle is, you know, finding the product, looking at the supply and demand, um, setting up the keywords, looking for pricing issues, looking for pricing, looking for um, competition, looking at which vendors sell all these things, making prices, seeing if you can find packaging. Are you restricted? Is it hazmat? All these other, all these things of building a bundle is something that you really should be researching. Is the supply going to meet the demand? Am I going to be able to package this? How much is it going to weigh? How much is it? Who's going to charge me for this bundle? Um, can I get pictures from the manufacturer? Or do I have to take my own? Uh, how long is the lead time from the vendor? So literally that was like a hundred questions all at once, right, Julia? But the thing is, is that this is why it takes longer than just a snapshot in time. This is why when you're moving from a retail arbitrage type seller, and by the way, I am not off my soapbox about retail arbitrage friends and you needing to slow down as well. Sometimes we just look at that snapshot, we look at that bottom line number, we think, oh, this is 110% ROI, it goes in the cart, and you forget to look that there's 527 sellers and the, the chances of this item price tanking in the near future is extremely high. So slow down retail arbitrage friends, read all the data, click through, look at Kifa, look at Camel, look at eBay, look at other places and make sure that it's a good buy. But back to the whole bundle taking a week thing, um, it depends on how much time that you dedicate it to. It doesn't have to take a week and not every one of my bundles takes that long. But if I'm bringing something brand new that I'm really unfamiliar with and I need to do all the research for all the things. I take time to make sure that all, these are the right things that this, you know, goes with this really well that I'm going to be able to sell it in a market where um, the price is going to be affordable for the buyer that they're going to use it in such a manner that it's not just, it's not just willy nilly. It's not just like, Oh, these kind of frequently bought together. I'm going to see what happens. I still looking at frequently bought together, do all the pieces of the puzzle. Yes, because just because they are frequently bought together does not necessarily mean that they should be sold together. Now, Julia makes the comment of doing mostly retail arbitrage bundles. There's one major difference. Well, there's a lot of major differences. One that I can think of. When you are doing retail arbitrage bundles, you're not having to lay down a lot of cash for, like you do with wholesale. Sometimes you can get smaller orders with wholesalers, but if you're going and buying $24.48, of an item, you have to really think through the bundle. When I used to do retail arbitrage bundles and I'd throw six up to see what happened, there was a different thought process I'd go through. Um, but I'm looking to create bundles that will sell consistently every single month over and over again for a period of time. Um, all bundles have their life cycle and even bundles that sold really well last year may not sell well this year because trends change. So being able to think about how you bundle in the process. We want you to spend time. And think about it this way. When you started selling on Amazon, how long did your first shipment take you to send in? It took me a month to get my first shipment in because I was so terrified to do it wrong. And so many people take so long. The same thing goes with bundling. The longer you do it, the better you get at it, the better you are at your process. And the faster you get, honestly, like it, every bundle does not take me a week. I actually can put bundles together pretty quickly, but if it's something that's out of my niche or out of my comfort zone, I will literally spend all the time necessary to make sure I have all the steps in place and all that's taken care of. I, I just, I want to turn over every single rock because I don't want to have to not deal with this later on. I even call vendors sometimes and ask them what the it's, just, it's, hard, it's hard to rephrase the question, but like, what is the likelihood of these particular items being discontinued in the next 12 months? It's one of my favorite questions to ask as far as reps that know specific product lines. They know what comes in and out a lot. They know what's more of what they considered seasonal. And I don't want to put a bundle together that I feel like it's going to be discontinued in the next six months because if it's a great seller, I'm going to be bummed. And you know how many times that's happened to me? Um, so I've learned to ask. <clears throat> It's a great question to ask because when you're in a niche, 
in, in our particular niche, you get to a point where you understand the catalogs and you're starting to see the life cycle. You know how long an item's been in a catalog. If you were just getting into it or you're newer with the vendor, you may not know that stuff yet. And so being able to ask your vendors or a wealth of information, do not be intimidated by them. They love to answer your questions. And if they don't know it, they're going to find the answer for you. Um, they yeah, have so if, much info. If they, if they answer really quickly, you know, you might want to just say, you know, could you just maybe check on that for me and just make sure, you know, sometimes products in a line are discontinued and, you know, they know a lot of times I, I found out my reps know far before a catalog is even being produced, what's going to be discontinued by the end of the year. Um, and I've learned to start asking that because I've been burned before creating this whole bundle, ordering stuff. And then they send me, you know, four items and the fifth item is literally like, oh, this is discontinued. Sorry. And I'm like, I literally just built a bundle out of this. And again, the, the question with what Amy's saying is absolutely right too. The, the risk in the, the risk and the amount of money that you're spending too um, calls for deeper research, I think, because, you know, we're spending a thousand dollars. I had a specific vendor on specific bundles. Like I don't want to make that kind of mistake. That's costly. So um, just to each his own, the better you get at bundling, the, the easier this becomes the more of a, a routine this, this becomes but if you are new or if you're struggling even if you're not new you're struggling to really find some really good sweet spots and bundles um, just make sure that you just spend the time answering all the questions so that you know you're solid by the end of even if it's three days you know whatever it, it whatever it takes you to feel like you're solid to pull the trigger um, the next part of goals is um, sales goals a lot of people set sales goals that are you know maybe reasonable, but they forget about the part that it takes to get to those sales goals. Correct. And so thinking about what you actually do to hit a sales goal, you can't just set a number out of thin air and say, I'm going to hit that goal. There are, you, you actually have to find, buy, and sell products to hit that sales goal. And so you need to have an idea of, okay, well, I want to hit here, you're not going to hit a million dollars in sales sending in $20,000 worth of inventory. That is some crazy ROI. If you can make that happen, um, I want a slice of whatever pie you're having because that's amazing. Um, so you have to look at it in such a way that you can break it down. Um, so there are some various variables to consider. There's time to invest. There's capital or money to invest. And what do you need to do to increase either of these so you can grow? Are you working a nine to five and doing this as a side hustle? You have more money than you do time. How do you make that work for you? Do you bring in a prep center so you can process more volume because you don't have the time, but somebody else has all the time in the world because they can process it for you? You know, and don't expect to see a change if you don't make one. I mean, if you change nothing, nothing changes, right? I mean, you can't expect to just be like, oh, my sales goals are going to double in 2019 or yeah, in 2019, I'm double my sales for this year. Okay. But I'm going to um, invest the same amount of time and the same amount of money that I did in 2018. That's not going to work. If you want to increase your sales by 10%, you're going to need to increase something else by 10%, whether it's your output, whether it's your money to invest, whether it's time or both. If you don't have any more money to invest and you want you'd have to find the time to find better products with better ROI. And that can be done with sheer research. And there's plenty of tools out there, even free ones that you can use to start increasing. When I started and I started increasing way back in the day, like there wasn't any of these tools, you guys, there wasn't. There wasn't jungle stuff. No, there was a flip phone and typing ISBN numbers into a flip phone, guys. Right. Who started in the Stone Age of FBA? <laughs> the Stone Age of FBA. That cracks me up. So, um, you know, just thinking about those things, um, more money tends to be what people need and want. So they want to increase sales so they can increase profit. Uh, so what they need to increase what is it that you want? So that's where you have to stop and think. You want to increase sales because you want to increase profit so you can increase your income. You want to increase your in income so that you can, what is that for you? Stop and think for a minute. Now I want to throw something in there as well because so often we um, are pushing towards or not stopping and thinking we're going towards that freedom and we forget to think about the why you're going towards the, the there's the 
I want to hit a million dollars, so I'm just going to sell whatever I can sell. Yeah, it can look like you're making a million dollars, but if you're selling at cost, you're not making any money. So just because you can turn it a $20 item and make 10 cents on it, is that worth your time, energy, and effort? Or does it make more sense to spend the time, energy, and research to find a better item with better return, right? So thinking about it, that's where we go back to the research. The same thing goes to retail arbitrage or bundles. Don't fill your cart with good inventory when you can fill it with great inventory. Spend the time to look to find the great products to bring to market. Because if you're really, if you're working for that freedom, so, you know, if you're dreaming big to, you know, quit your day job and do Amazon full time, if it's freedom that you're after, working more won't get you there. (laughs) Working harder and longer hours and, you know, deep diving isn't going to get you there. Working smarter gets you there. And both Kristen and I have been there. We've gotten to the points, why do you think we shifted from retail arbitrage into wholesale and wholesale bundles? We got to a point that we couldn't find enough product in the time we wanted to spend to continue to grow the way we wanted to. I didn't want to spend 70 or 80 hours a week sourcing product at Walmart and Walgreens and Target. Thank you very much. Yeah, we were coming to the point where we were physically exhausted from doing all of the retail arbitrage, running around store to store, trying to find more and more product and, you know, at good margins. And we ended up, you know, kind of rushing and being lazy um, because we're like, oh, this is good enough. But good enough isn't the best. If you spend the, excuse me, if you spend the time, you will find the best and you can. So thinking about what you really want and how to start working smaller, what can you do right now? to make other things in the future either unnecessary or easier. There's a lot of things you can do right now to make the other things in the future unnecessary. Like hiring a prep center makes it unnecessary for me to process inventory, which gives me a whole ton of time back in my day to do what is a money-making task, which is looking for new bundles to sell. I saw a number today, which I was still proud of. A friend of mine hit $5 million and that has increased over the past like four, four or five years. And they hit $5 million this, this year. And I was, you know, so happy for them. And I'm not discounting anything, but I looked at their ASP and their average selling price was $12 and 95 cents. And I just went, Oh, I was like, do you know how much product that you have to sell at $12 and 95 cents to heat $5 million? I'm like, I, I didn't do the math in my head. I didn't want to. I was like, no, thanks. I really like my ASP at $27 and 38 cents. Thank you very much. I don't want to work that hard. That's a lot of volume. And that's totally fine for people who can do that. And that's great. Walmart plays a volume game. Lots and lots of people play the volume game. They make pennies on the dollar and they just push, push, push stuff through. But I'm just like, oh, that stresses me out to the max to try to think about what it's like to move that kind of product around. And I'm like, no way, I don't ever want that. (laughs) But this is a whole idea. It is the same thing that Amy was saying. That like, you can get to a number, but are you profiting? See, to me, I don't set sales goals. I set profit goals. I'm like, okay, this year, I want to raise my ASP to $29.99, ditch some of the lower ones, get up to a higher price point, and put more profit in my pocket for working for the same amount. I'm working for for more profit in my pocket and working less because I'm selling more. You see, so I like the reverse volume. How much more can I make on something so I don't have to sell as many units? (laughs) So I love doing that and thinking about those. But whatever your goals are, those kind of concrete goals, increase, like someone was asking in in the chat here, can you give us some really concrete examples of what this looks like? So going back to what we just said a few minutes ago, in order to project your sales goals, Something that's realistic and reasonable goes coincides with how much more you're willing to increase to put that in. So it doesn't always equal that. So this year, if we want to double our goals, we do not have to double our workload. We have a team and we have people that help us and we can double their work workload (laughs) before we double our own. (laughs) But like at some point, it's probably going to have to increase at least 50%. So if you're looking to double your sales, you're probably going to have to increase some of your output of time, energy, and money by by at least half that. So make sure you're measuring it within that. If you're saying, I can increase my input by 10% and I expect 100% return on that, that's not realistic. 
So try to measure whatever your sales goals are with how much more you're willing to put in. If it's 10% more hours, 10% more research time, 10% more whatever, make it kind of an equal opportunity or at least a good balanced ratio when you're trying to figure out those numbers um, going forward. It is all about that one next step. We come back to this in many, many, many of our shows because the reality is setting realistic goals is the first step. Being able to take the one step, the next step towards them is the only way you're actually going to get to accomplish those realistic goals that you're setting for yourself. It's being realistic in setting them, but it's also being realistic in taking action and moving towards. Maybe you need accountability. Maybe I should be better at actually sharing the goals. I've gotten better. That was from two years ago. <clears throat> and I, I share a lot more of what my goals are now. And sometimes Kristen rolls her eyes at me, um, but she's usually great with the constructive criticism as to why to, I need to look at things differently. And if you don't have that person in your life, ask your spouse, ask a friend, come into the Facebook group and say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who can help me ping pong some ideas around. We've formed a number of groups of masterminding people who work together out of the Mommy Income group who can do that with each other. And we want that same thing for you. Because sometimes, whether it's setting realistic goals or being able to know what the next action step or just taking that action step, especially if it's hard. One of the hardest things for me to do is to get out of my comfort zone and go away from the niche that I'm currently working on. I've been in the same niche for two and a half years and Kristen's constantly saying, look at this catalog, look at this catalog. You have all of these. So go and do the process through something that's new. Even though it's uncomfortable, it's helpful to have that accountability to push you through that action. And I do want to say, you know, Amy, we help each other. Like Amy helps me to like, sometimes I take this one step thing a little too lightly and she's like, yeah, you thought about your next step, but did you think about this, this, and this? I mean, that's going to come. You know that, right? I'm like, maybe, or I hadn't thought of that. So thank you. So there are some things. So you, that's why we say the both and. So you've got to have some sort of aim out here. Like I said, the, the top of the stair steps of that in a perfect world. Like, gosh, I know Eric is here. So I'm going to tell, he's already told his story. So I know he's giving me permission to kind of talk about, you know, some goals that he has, but I know he wants to replace his corporate job income with his Amazon income. And he is well on his way to doing that. So that is his big, you know, in a perfect world. My wife and I work from home. We do, you know, these great things and Amazon business and I, you know, I'm not subject to, you know, corporate ladders and, you know, someone else tell me what to do and all that. So he's well on his way to that. But in the meantime, he still has to plan those very next steps in order to get to that place. And I must tell you that he is really good at planning those next steps because he's always taking action. So, you know, if you see Eric in the Facebook group, you know, just give him a virtual hug and tell him he's doing awesome because he is. Um, but that's the, what I mean is you have to have the both and. So you've got, so you know where the top of the stairs are, but then you're, you're taking one step at a time. No, no jumping three or four or five steps to try try to get up there. It's one calculated, consistent step at a time. It, now, we have it, some good questions about budget and money that I definitely want to get to. Oh, I'm letting Kristen roll with that. But I want to say the comment about talking about the steps. We tend to want to go two or three steps at a time. That's like the natural, we want to rush through it. But there are important things and reasons that you want to take each one of those steps along the way. When you think like, oh, that's, I don't need to do that. I can skip over that. A lot of times that comes back to bite you in the long run. So spending the time on each one of the steps is important in being able to accomplish your in a perfect world scenario. And honestly, it's taking time to, to master where you're at. So if you're doing retail arbitrage, like we did not move on to bundles and wholesale until we really, we, like we were doing retail arbitrage for a long time and really had a solid hang on it. I mean, literally I could probably scan stuff in my sleep and be like, yeah, 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 no, no, no. Like just, it, it became second nature. And once it's, once you're at second nature point, it's time for you to level up. It's time for you to get out of your comfort zone and do something that's going to level you up. Just saying, that's just my soapbox there. Now, I do wanna answer these questions. So what can you do to increase profit without increasing your budget or effort? Is that possible? Well, yes. Um, I don't know about the effort part. You don't necessarily have to create a hole in your budget. What you might have to do is increase your profit margin. In order to increase your profit margin without spending in more money, you have to do better research. So you're not gonna be able to just be like, how can I just increase without putting in any budget or effort? <laughs> You're not. Don't be, you know, that's not realistic. So think more about which one do you want to increase. If you don't have any extra money to put in the ring, 
then you have to think about making more money by with with more profit margin. It's it's going after the best product you can find instead of settling for the good. It's spending the time to put a little more research into finding that better product. Maybe it's scanning a whole, you know, a different shelf if you're doing retail arbitrage, or it's sitting down and doing some more of the in-depth research about products and whatnot from wholesale vendors um, to be able to find the best product that you can for the funds that you have. And we have a question here about, speaking of working capital, what are your feelings about Amazon loans? Well, we don't trust feelings. We trust facts. You don't want to hear my feelings about loans. You want to hear the facts. <laughs> the facts about F FBA loans and loans from Amazon is they're easy to obtain. If they are going to offer you one, that means they're probably, you know, if, if they're sending you lending offers or, hey, take this loan, the, the chances of them like approving that is almost 100%. They've already decided you're worthy of a loan. Um, my biggest thing I will say about Amazon loans is that if you are going to take an Amazon loan, spend all the money on all the products before you hit submit to that application. And what I mean is you better know exactly how, many, how much money is going and how you're going to spend that money before you take the loan. So if Amazon's offering you a $10,000 loan, then I would look at that and say, okay, I need to spend this $10,000 before I actually have that money in my account ready to send your POs to wherever you're sending them. You need to have your money. And here's why because they give you 30 days before they even make you make a payment at all, or even start charging you any sort of interest. So you have 30 days on your money. By the time you hit send, you can spend that money with your vendors right away, and you can have product on the shelf before you even make your first payment. So that is my number one suggestion for Amazon loans. But I will say with that, do not just find random things to fill up your $10,000 so you can say, I have enough to spend. This is where it's important to make sure that you are spending the time, energy, and effort to find good, profitable product that's going to sell during your term of your loan or before that so that you're not sitting on product that you bought with loan money that isn't selling. That's exactly what my point is. And Eric is even saying here, take the Amazon loans, but they had, they had taken loans, but they spent the money in less than two weeks. They knew exactly what they were going to buy before they took the loan. And that's exactly, we've taken several loans from Amazon in order to kind of level up to the next level. But what we've done was we had basically our POs hit send the, mo the, the moment the money was in our hand. We already had products ready. We had bundles created. We were ready to press go. And we already knew what we were buying. We already had the confidence that we did the research that these items will sell, will make our money back, and we won't have any problems paying this loan. Um, the number two thing I will say, and like, I'm going to like all my Dave Ramsey friends are going to be like, oh my gosh, you told people to take a loan. No, I didn't. I'm just telling you if you're going to, and I have no, no choice in that situation, what, what you choose to do. But if you do that, make sure that your bottom line, your personal bank account can cover that if your business can't. Because in an event that Amazon suspends you or something crazy happens, we can't predict those things, that loan is due no matter what. So you're going to need to pay that. And so you better have a backup plan. I never get a loan from Amazon without having the money to be able to pay it just in case. That's just the way it goes. But if you have it, then you can extend it long term and you can get longer terms. One of our favorite ways to do this, this, you know, money's my jam, right? numbers and all this stuff. I literally jungle these, juggle these numbers. So if you get an Amazon loan and then you have terms with your vendors that say 60 day dating for holidays, for example, order back in July, they don't charge you till December 10th. And then you have 60 days to pay that before it even charges any interest. I literally can make all of the profit on this money before I even have to pay off the loan. So $10,000 turns into $30,000 before I even have to pay the first payment. So I like to stagger things like that so that, but I keep really, really, really good records, like literally on calendars of when money's due. So if you're good about that, explore the loans. They will help you grow if you're wise with them. Wise, pay attention, keep track, understand the risks that come with any kind of credit for your business. Oh, oh, you crossed 300,000 this year. I'm so glad the year's not even over yet. So happy for you. That is a great milestone. Any milestone that you're celebrating. If you just hit a $1,000 day for the first time, 
great. We're so proud of any milestones because that means you're taking action and taking action is doing, what did you say the other day? Your, your, your quote the other day, you said, I know, I'm thinking, hold on, give me a second. <laughs> I've said a lot of things in the past couple of days. I know. <laughs> oh, the, the quote about like, no matter what you're doing, you're doing way better than all the people that aren't trying oh. to Yes. If you, if you are doing, if you are taking action, if you're moving forward in your Amazon business, you're better off than any of the people who are still not doing the Amazon thing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. As long as you're taking a step forward, you're taking a step that somebody else isn't taking. And the other thing, the other quote that I love that somebody shared with me the other day, if you change by 1% every day in 2019 or from this point forward, at the end of 365 days, you will have changed 365%. Yeah. For so sure. in perspective, guys, spend the time to grow that 1%. It doesn't feel like a lot. It doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. But if you keep putting in the consistent energy and effort and time and money into this, it can go where you dream it can go. <laughs> Gail's asking me if I'll stand up so everyone can see my sweater. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to see the sweater. It's awful. But my let me remind you that this sweater was in the youth department and we had to make the best of what was available to us. I'll do my best. This camera's a little wonky, but I will show you the sweater if I can get far enough back to um, without knocking your back without knocking myself off or throwing down my background. This might be tricky. Just gotta move the chair, guys. All the logistics we have to set up for a show for you guys, <laughs> it is like a thing. Like we have all of the stuff that we do so that we can make this. I love the shadow. I, I feel like I look like Yoda with a hat on. You do look like Yoda. Okay. Just so I bet I can back this up, hopefully without making it fall down. Oh, you guys are looking at this. This is this is high tech stuff here. I'm trying not to fall out. Okay, so this is the sweater. It says, the struggle is real. Santa, it's got um, jingle Christmas balls and jingle bells. And um, it is just fabulous. And I will probably wear it. See, the struggle is real. It is real. Okay, that's enough for me. Embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> enough. But seriously, like, this, um, I promised I would also wear this in public. That was before I realized that um, it would be like the Grinch's heart and be 12 sizes too small. <laughs> but I will make good on my promise. It just wasn't going to be today because I was doing <laughs> I can't even repeat that because it sounds too bad. I love the balls on it. Um, yeah, these are, this is really classic tacky, but I can't help it because um, the struggle is real. And since that's um, a thing I had to wear this sweater. So there, that's reality. I don't feel like I'm upsetting. So you guys, we hope you have a wonderful, amazing holiday. Be sure to come to the Facebook group and share some of your goals. First of all, when you get it out into the universe, you're more accountable. It's this Hawthorne effect where um, I've been studying this because this is a little chapter in my book that we're going to talk about um, down the road. But you know, it's this Hawthorne effect where people do better work when they're being observed. Can I get an amen? When you know that someone's watching you, you're going to do better. You just know that if a boss is standing over you, if somebody walks in and watches what you're doing, or you even notice that someone's observing you, you're already standing up straighter. You're already like, okay, I got to perform at my best because somebody's watching. Um, I do it too. I ain't even going to lie. Um, and it's actually this thing that's been proven over and over and over again. So when you know that someone's checking up on you, when you know that you put your goals out into the world, that you've spoken them, that you've written them, that someone has liked your Facebook page or whatever that you said you're doing this. I mean, I have no choice, you guys. I literally told the universe that I'm publishing a book. And so I kind of have to do that. Turned the rough draft in this week. <sighs> that was a lot of work. Um, I'm still really scared to death and it's going to be baby steps to get there, but it's out in the universe. I can't like renege now. I have to be able to put that out there. So we're challenging you guys. Do the same thing. Bring us your hard goals. Bring us your scary stuff. Be brave and put it out there and we will lightly and gently nudge you along that path because we want to see you succeed guys we don't sit here every week and just blow smoke at you we our goal with all of this is to help you in hopes to someday surpass what we've been able to accomplish so that's the reality so if you are not a member of our facebook group head over to mommyincome.com join us 
with a really long code word. It's called, it's FBA Goals 2019. Bring that code word, we will let you into the group so that you can share your goals with the community so that we can help hold you accountable to meeting those goals in 2019. Now, we will not see you. Coming to workshops, we're so excited to meet you in just like, is that just like a couple of weeks, like three, maybe three and a half weeks or so? Oh three and a half weeks till our first workshop in Atlanta. If you have not grabbed a seat in Lansing, do it like yesterday because it's almost full and we really would like you to not have to wait till August to get into a workshop. We want you to be able to start the year off right. Getting bundles in is part of your business. So if you're interested in learning more, mommyincome.com slash workshop will get you all the information that you need. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, make sure that you go and grab that because we are going to be launching some podcast only episodes at the end of this year so that we can keep you jamming while we're on vacation. Because guys, we are taking next week off. And I will tell you, it's an amazing feeling to say I am taking a week off for my Amazon business. Um, it's a really amazing thing to get there. And we want that for each and every one of you. We don't want you to come to the end of Q4 and take a week off because you're burnt out. We're taking a week off that we're going to get to enjoy, not because we're going to lie on the couch and be like, I don't even know what day of the week it is. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, it's just like a, it's a really sweet thing to be able to do that. And don't worry if you're not there yet, maybe that's the top of your steps. And you're like, okay, next Q4, I want to be able to take a week off and not worry. Cause you know, what's not taking a week off the sales, you know, what's not taking a week off. Um, like the people that work for us, <laughs> they're working, <laughs> but we're not, uh, that's the, that's where we want you guys to be at some point, but remember baby steps. So just share your baby steps with us. We want to congratulate you. We want to hold you accountable and we want to celebrate even the small steps with you because every step is worth the effort. It's worth some praise. So you all get participation in trophies in mommy income because we really want you to take the next step. So um, we're proud of you no matter what action you have. So happy holidays, Merry Christmas and happy new year. And we will see you in the new year. We will see you in 2019. Have a great end of the year, everyone. Mm-hmm.